Well, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for staying with us. We had just a couple of minutes delay uh, due to a glitch, but we're here as ever on Dojo Live, connecting experts like you, like you. And uh, this is Carlos Ponce here in Mexico City, and of course my fellow teammate near Sofian Tulio Siragusa, way over there in Los Angeles. How to hi Tulio? Hey, good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> cool. Happy to be here. So absolutely, it's a pleasure as ever, uh, Tulio. And of course. And last but not least, we have our, our um, featured guest of today's uh, show. And we have here Paul Zikopoulos. Paul, I, I hope I got that, that, that pronunciation right. Please let me know, OK? It was excellent. It was excellent. Perfect. Awesome. OK. And Paul is, uh, is vice president of big data and cognitive systems at IBM. And it's a pleasure to have you here, Paul. We're honored. And, um, and today, Correct me if I'm wrong, but today we're, I think we're going to be speaking about a business that thinks. That's today's topic, right, Paul? Yeah, you got it. That's what I want to really talk about, this movement from analytics, from descriptive and prescriptive to this cognitive. First, I want to apologize for being late. I think there was something wrong with the Canadian internet. But listen, this is true NAFTA, as you described. We've got Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. So we just had to work out a little kinks in the deal, but we're here. But I want to get to the essence of where thinking businesses are going. And, you know, I've been in this business for a long time. I've written about 19 books on data and analytics, and I'm going to give you my analogy. When I started years ago, I started out telling people to go find needles in the haystack, and that was data warehousing. And then we moved along to the Hadoop world, the big data world, if you will. And the notion behind the big data world was, Let's put all our information into a data lake and we'll be able to find insights. Well, the equivalent of that in my analogy is we decided we would find the needle in the haystack if we added more hay. Well, we didn't quite get there. And today it's about finding needles and stacks of needles. And that's what a thinking business is all about. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for elaborating a little bit on that. and. Okay, here's the thing. I'd like to ask you uh, just a couple of questions, Paul, yeah. and then we can uh, start moving on in more in depth uh, on today's uh, chosen topic. First of all, can you uh, please uh, tell us a little bit about you, about you, your 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 background, and of course yeah. what your role at IBM. Let's start with that, and then we can continue with. Uh, all right. Uh, what can I tell you? Twenty three years at IBM. It shocks me sometimes. I think that's a statement to the great company I work for. And, you know, listen, all companies have their trials and tribulations and their successes, but it's a company that's steeped in tradition and in technology. And so, you know, I've been there 23 years. I spent 10 years in the development lab and database, and I started reaching out to clients there with writing. So I wrote the book DB2 for Dummies um, and a number of other database books. Uh, then I graduated out of there. I kind of came out into the field and worked with clients. Fell in love with clients, so ever since then I've been with clients. I wrote the book Hadoop for Dummies, for example, and then I've done some offering management, skills, enablement, and now I'm kind of an evangelist around analytics and cognitive systems. And that's me and 20 years at IBM. And the only thing I'll tell you is 20 years at IBM, 20 years at analytics, I've become really popular and cool in the last two to three years. All of a sudden, everybody loves analytics, so this is a good thing. Thank you so much, Paul. And I think it is definitely. But uh, in, okay, here's the thing. In, in elaborating a little bit more into today's chosen topic, is we're going to be taking an in-depth look into the mysterious world of deep learning and AI. And that's definitely an eye grabber, an attention grabber. You know, when you say the mysterious world of deep learning and AI, doesn't get any more uh, appealing than that. So please tell us about why you chose this particular topic. Well, here's the mystery. We all hear of AI, and uh, I know when I tell my parents about what I do, uh, I don't still know if they understand it or not, but I say I do artificial intelligence, and my mother gets all upset. Oh, does this mean it's going to take over the world? And she's seen the movie Terminator 3 and those types of things, right? And that's not what that is. That's called general AI, not taking over the world, but that kind of intelligence. We don't even expect that in our life until about 2080. 2070, so somewhere in there. The mysterious world of a deep thinking business is mysterious because this is about what we call narrow AI. And it's allowing computers to invert the way we operate. So the way we operate today 
is we write a bunch of code about a compute to a computer and we execute that code. And when we want to change rules or the way that our code works, the way we score a credit risk, the way we score a customer who's highly to a trip, we change the rules, right? We learned if you did this, then you do that. You go to the computer, type it in, you recompile and you deliver the program. What the deep thinking business and why it's mysterious is we flip it on ahead. And instead of writing code, we give data to the computer. We don't give code to the computer. We give data to the computer and we ask the computer to go figure out the pattern. And what's interesting about that is if I want to write a program that can drive an autonomous vehicle and turn right at a certain intersection, or if I'm writing a computer recognition example that would know what the letter A looks like, or I want to figure out someone who's not going to pay their credit on time. I don't write new code. I change the data. And that's what makes it so mysterious are these algorithms that are looking at the data, that are finding patterns, and they're learning for themselves, creating these neural networks that operate as a loose analogy, much like our brains do. That's why it's mysterious. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you Thank so you much, Paul. Uh, okay. Tulio, let me pass on the mic to you. Yes, yeah, so Paul, this is a very intriguing, exciting topic for me. I've been following for many years. And uh, so tell us a little bit about where does this, where does the rubber meet the road? You know, why yeah. is it such a big deal? What's the intended value that can be extracted today? Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So first I'll tell you, um, the value hits the road in that we're in this era of um, we're not in the golden age of AI, we're in the golden age of AI assisted productivity. And so the reason why the rubber hits the road are two things, where you're gonna hit the rubber to the road, where you're gonna get the success, because we're not all Googles or Teslas, right? We're not, all, we're not funding self-driving cars, is what are the problems today that humans use to solve problems? So if I'm a customer service rep and you're calling me about an issue, what do I do? I go into your your records and I look at, you know, what's your current situation and I go into the past of customers like you and I look at their situation. So if a human can solve the problem, then AI is going to help them. It's going to help them do it more quickly. That's number one. Number two is the rubber hits the road because of supervised learning. So there's kind of two major kinds of this deep learning, this mysterious world, really three. There's supervised, there's unsupervised, or, or and then there's semi-supervised. Supervised learning is when we know the outcomes. So I'm just going to talk about that one. You can imagine if I wanted to teach a computer what an A looked like, I would give it 100 A's. And the computer would eventually figure out that, you know, it's got uh, two feet. I'm just going to try to draw an A right here and see if I can put it on the screen. You guys told me to use a pen and not technology. See my A right here? You guys see that? Okay, now I'm going to show you what a computer would see in this A, right? Look at the circles. A computer would see the tip, it would see a bridge, so the apex, the bridge, and it's got two feet. But the computer would recognize this as a whole bunch of numbers. So this would be supervised learning. So if I started flying A's across, hundreds of A's to the computer, eventually the computer knows what an A looks like. That's supervised learning, we know the outcomes. And guess what all you folks out there watching are sitting on? Labeled supervised data, you absolutely know when a customer trips, you know when a customer doesn't pay their bill on time, you know what a risky mortgage looks like, you know what a customer that buys more looks like, you know that a customer that you can cross sell looks like. And so the reason why the rubber can hit the road is A, we're doing this with humans, so let's take that data, feed it to these algorithms and assist those humans in doing, not replace them, but assist them with the data we already have. So so that's great. Now, there's, there's talk about really two tracks, right? People think about what's big data, analytics, AI, what is it all about, right? And, there, and there's some who believe there's really two tracks. One is the industrial internet, which is about preventing problems, right? Machines talking to each other to potentially predict the problem. Right. And then there's smart workforces, right? It's about intelligence. And um, what can this do, like, for example, with, with life sciences? If, if, I can, if I can find a cure to a disease, but it's going to take I don't know, millions of permutations of different formulations. Is this going to be something that would help there? How would it be applied there? 
Yeah, it enormously helps. Uh, it helps not just with disease, but healthcare already. And it's actually the emergence of what you talked about. So you talked about the industrial internet. So let me tell you about this epoch type generation that we've been in our lives that we've transformed. <clears throat> when the internet came out, it brought us together under search and communities. And we saw, you know, Facebook and, and Google Hangouts and all those kinds of things. And those were about people talking to people. Everyone can talk to everyone. What the industrial internet is about, or internet of things, is where everything can talk to everything. So we instrument it, whether it's a bridge communicating whether roads are slippery, the health of a concrete, or whether it's a shirt that can actually read at a thousand times a second, so every millisecond, my physiological markers, such as my body temperature, my perspiration level, my heart rate. This is in place today, folks. When those two things come together, they change every single industry. And since you brought up healthcare, I'll give you a great example. One would be um, from Discovery for Cures. So if I think of pharmaceutical, the ability to go and simulate, uh, you know, genetic uh, precision medicine or to simulate new compounds uh, for pharma, to do that in a computer, in a simulation model versus in real life is night and day. And step out of healthcare, for example, for a second, who is the first ever people who did genomics, which is now all the rage in the future of healthcare, it's Monsanto, Monsanto. All right, that's what they did. So they started out and you would drive by these fields where they genetically engineer the seed and you'd drive by miles and miles of a corn stalk, which every stalk was a different corn stalk. And it would take six to 12 months to develop the seed and understand its movement. Today, they do that in computers and they develop seed potentials in two to three months versus 12 months. Uh, versus 12 months. So now move that into medicine. So pharma discovery, but what about everyday ailments? Think about um, pneumonia. So in pneumonia, you come in, it affects some uh, 2 million people or there's some 2, two million people uh, in, the, in the United States monthly go through a pneumonia dose in which they need to be hospitalized. And how could we go and understand pneumonia? Today, what we do is we use what we call a medical, uh, medical imaging modality. We take an x-ray, x-ray, CAT scan, so on and so forth. And how do we go and examine that? We give it to a technician, a radiologist, or a doctor that has to look at that. Well, we've taken a uh, computer that thinks, if you will, very simple to do, AI, and trained it with a whole bunch of x-rays that these experts had deemed to say, this is pneumonia. And now the computer can detect pneumonia with better accuracy than the expert can. Why? Well, the expert doesn't have enough time. The expert might miss a little tiny thing, a little, what looks like a scratch on the, on the uh, x-ray. They might miss that, which is the starting of, of, um, of a pneumonia. And so that's an example where we can detect disease quicker, we can treat disease quicker, we can look at its progression quicker. And I can take that uh, just real quick to finish the example to anything. As sure as I can detect pneumonia better from an x-ray better than the experts, but why? It's because the experts trained it for us. And computers don't get tired. They don't get it's a Friday night need to take off. So I could go and do that with a mole. So imagine you have a mole on your arm and I take a picture of it. And I understand what a cancerous lesion looks like because it has shapes and attenuations. Imagine now I'm taking a picture of that mole every week for three or four years. The computer will tell me as it morphs into a potential cancerous lesion. So those are two examples where this can absolutely change healthcare. Wow, that's fantastic. So the other thing I wanted to ask is, uh, there's much talk lately about human to machine learning. How far are we really from that? Is that actually a, a reality or is that just mostly buzz today? Where, what are you seeing? Well, like I think we're, we're down that path. It's an early path now, right? And I think the whole notion of what I just described is a great example of human to machine learning, right? There's different ways in which we will teach these deep neural networks. And this is why I said earlier, the way to get going and the way that makes it real is supervised learning. So go back to that x-ray example. I can give you a thousand x-rays that a human expert will go and say, these 900 is pneumonia, these 100 is not. So that's a human transfer into machine. And the reason why AI will be even more important if you think about it is as we go into a new generation of workers, millennials come up, generation Z will follow, and then generation alpha after that. How do we transfer the knowledge that we have? So today we talk about transfer of human to human learning. 
That's very difficult. Human to human learning is us talking today. Maybe now my great oncologist, cancer doctor at my hospital is retired. How are they going to dump their brain and their knowledge into this new, um, these new doctors that are coming in? But if we used and trained artificial intelligence and we're a deep thinking business, we would be training the computers to know what we know. And that would help in this transfer learning. So it's happening today. Wow. Okay. So I'm very curious. What are some of the projects you're working on? What are your, what are your like, oh solving, <laughs> thing, thing? this is very curious. Share, share some stories with us. Yeah. Uh, listen, I work on everything. It's funny. One of the interesting things in my domain is it's I'm very cross industry. So for example, um, I'll bring up uh, the sensory of Stevie wonder. So, I I don't know what the age is of all the listeners. Sometimes when I get to the millennials, they may not know who Stevie Wonder is. But so he's this famous musician, right? Um, and they may not know he's blind. Okay, so Stevie Wonder is a blind musician. What most people don't know, even if they love Stevie Wonder, is why is he blind? And he's blind because of something called ROP, the retinopathy of prematurity. And so when you have a neonatal baby, I mean, this is the most precious life. They're born early. Uh, we incubate them in the NICU, which is the neonatal ICU. So this is a project we did at Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. As we incubate them in the NICU, they oxygenate the neonatal baby, and that's what sends more children home with their parents. Well, in Stevie Wonder's case, they gave him too much oxygen, and it burned the back of his eye, of his retina out, and that's why he's blind. And when we started to investigate what do hospitals do when they learn, they do what we call, or when they measure, they do what we call these top of hour or spot readings. I measure the oxygen rate for Stevie Wonder every hour. I measure the temperature of the baby every 15 minutes or every half hour. And if there's not an alarm sounding, well then guess what? We're not gonna worry about anything. So what we did is we decided to start measuring certain physiological markers every millisecond, a thousand times a second we would measure instead of once every hour or half hour. And we saw about a 20 to 30% difference in the oxygenation rates at a certain hospital than what they thought they were giving to what they were giving. This is what they thought, this is what they gave, right? So that's a great example of a really cool project I'm working on. And at SickKids Hospital, it's about trying to predict the onset of a certain disease called namiosarcosis. And we understand the physiological markers of this neonatal baby, and that's what we did at SickKids. But then I could transfer you all the way uh, to some work that we did at H&R Block with their tax consultants. We literally taught the computer at IBM, uh, our Watson computer, we taught it about U.S. tax law. These are millions of pages of, of, uh, of documents and cases and stuff's always changing. So once again, this is about feeding different kinds of data. All the way to, and this was my favorite, I'm dressed to go because it's 20 degrees in Canada. That's centigrade. So... Uh, I, I like to think we stole the LA weather today. That's about 74 degrees, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And we've been in a long winter up here. So I'm going golfing. Well, we taught a computer all about golf. We taught a computer at the Masters what golf was. What was a player who was excited because they, they sunk a putt? And what was the score? And what was the crowd cheering and all that kind of stuff? And the computer was able to assemble personalized highlights. So I have my app and I say, show me the highlights. It knows who my favorite players are. That's structured data. It knows the events that took place because of gestures and crowd noise and scores. And it would assemble my own highlight reel. And I could even tell it, don't put a spoiler moment in it. Don't tell me what happened. Just get me excited. And we could customize that for every single individual in the world who signed up for the app. So from sports all the way to medicine, all the way to retail, this stuff's changing the world. Those are just three of the many projects I'm working on. Wow, how exciting. That is. I, I read recently some uh, an article, I forget where it was, that between Google, IBM, Apple, and I think Amazon, over $30 billion have been spent in AI research and development just in the past two years. That's just astonishing. You know, so I get these projects you're working on, which is great, but what's the, wh where we're we going? What's the end goal here? And how does, how does like, I mean, I also read something about Sergey, the co-founder of Google talking about responsibility, right? So wh what are your thoughts on that as it relates to the potential threat to jobs and things like that, that some people are concerned with? 
So I love where you're going uh, with that question. I will tell you, uh, I'll tell you our, our point of view at IBM um, in terms of the jobs. This is not man versus machine. This is man or woman with machine. Now there will be job loss. There was job loss when electricity completely revolutionized you know, our industry. There was job loss when 80% of people were farmers until we delivered a mechanical engine and things changed. However, the people that should be worried about losing their jobs are the people who stick their heads in the sands and pretend that this change is not here. It's man with machine, okay? So managers that want to pretend that AI won't be a big part of their customer service desk, they're probably going to lose their job because they just didn't keep current. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to be a programmer, but you have to be comfortable in using that kind of technology. And I'll give you a great example. So we all know Gary Kasparov, right? champion chess player that IBM beat in what the 1994, 93, whenever it was. And when it beat him, and I don't know if anyone knows the iconic photo, he's like, he's like, like this, right? It reminds me of a calculus test in university back many years ago, which I still have nightmares. But he said, you know what? That computer beat me. It wasn't smarter than me. It had access to 100,000 chess matches. It had access to way more chess matches than I could have. Had I had access to those same matches, I could have beat that computer. And then was born this thing called Centaur Chess. And Centaur Chess is chess in which you can play any way you want. You can play you as a human, you can play you with a computer, or the computer can be its own player. And so since the invention of Centaur Chess, I'll, I'll share with you three really interesting facts. One, there has never been more excitement around chess. The numbers are way up in chess. More people are playing than ever. That's man with machine. Number two is there have never been more grandmasters in chess. So this man and machine actually let other commoners, if you will, elevate their chess game and become grandmaster status. And I like to think of that as the way that our data is supposed to work. Today, big data analytics and AI, it's really for the privileged few. And we want to democratize it for the many. Everybody has to get involved in data. And Centaur Chess allowed that. I could become a Centaur player with the help of a computer. Their games got better. But here's the big stat. They have this big tournament, Centaur tournaments. And again, some businesses just submit a machine and it's its own player. And when you look at the results of the last tournament I looked at, 53 people won in the total tournament that were Centaur Chess players, man and machine. 42 computers won, okay, their matches. That's how many ones, wins they had. You know how many humans won alone? Here, I'm going to write it down for you. I'm going to create the suspense. Here it comes. Zero. Wow. Man with machine outplayed man and outplayed machine. And that's the future of it. Now, behind that, to answer your second question, and I know we're kind of tight on time, but Listen, I'll stay as long as you want me to because I'll go on forever. Ethics, folks, especially if you're in, in the U.S. under politics, I think ethics and explainability of how the algorithm, algorithm arrived at the decision is going to be the tripwire that hits everybody. Everyone's trying to run the AI, but they're putting governance as an afterthought. You put it as a forethought. I have to explain the model. And in a world of fake news and bias, you need to be defensible about those algorithms, either in a court of law or in the court of public opinion. And governance is going to matter enormously in those cases. Well, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate that. This is probably the most simple way I've heard anyone explain any of these topics, uh, which anyone can understand. I really appreciate that. So, you know, there's a lot of players in this space. Yeah. Uh, you know, what makes what you're working on in, in IBM unique? What's okay. Why would I choose you guys? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Here's what I'll tell you. Uh, there's some sexy stuff out there, right? Google's doing cool stuff. And, uh, and I tip my hat to everybody elevating everyone's game. Uh, but I want you to step back and think of a couple things. First, I'll tell you, uh, and I mean this in a humble way, but I can work wherever I want, right? And I have that kind of credentials and that long in this industry. And it's that as a topic. And I choose to work here. And why did I choose to work here? I think there's a number of reasons. First off is I think that IBM is bringing a total story to a customer. And I don't think many other vendors can do that. Um, I mean, Amazon can't help me on premises. It's not like everything's in the cloud instantly. People talk about cloud. I want to tell your viewers this, and this is a whole other interview we should do. 
Cloud is a capability, not a destination. It is the agile manner in which I want to deploy. So IBM is full on hybrid cloud, right? Which means on premise and in the cloud. Number two is we own an architecture, a platform. So infrastructure matters again. In this deep learning world, as we want to build bigger algorithms, commodity servers don't cut it. We do offloads to GPU and we need accelerants for the GPUs and the IO. Well, IBM is in that part. This is all math under the covers, folks. IBM has the largest commercial mathematics research organization in the world. We have a health organization which focuses on this kind of stuff. So when you look at that, we're an ability to change the world with the whole solution. We have a governance solution, those kinds of things. Nobody else brings that. And here's the final thing I think I'll tell you. When you go to leverage cloud APIs, the one thing that IBM doesn't do, which I'm proud of, is we don't use your data to make us better and make profit off of your data. If you go look at the uh, Azure licensing, and it's not to take a shot at them, it's just a different business model, right? It's not, for some people, there's nothing wrong with it. But once you stop using the Azure business model for visual recognition, they can keep your images. How do you think Google built their visual recognition model? You loaded up your photos for free in Acacia, and they went and looked all over at your photos. So I think that's one thing our CEO has put in place is that we're not gonna use your data to make us smarter. We're gonna use your data to make you more successful. And, and I think that's a pretty cool proposition to have for the right clients. And that's what makes us different. Well, that's great. Hey, thanks, Paul. I, I love to see the enthusiasm and excitement from someone who's been with a big company for 23 years match up what you typically see from startup guys. Uh, congratulations. Great job. Uh, I'm going to pass this back to uh, Carlos with some final questions. I know we're coming up on time. So, and well, first of all, before I jump into any other questions of my own, uh, two things. If uh, this is for the audience out there, um, if you have any questions for Paul, you can send them over. If you're watching out there in somewhere in the world and you're not, I mean, you're not part uh, watching at yourself, you can simply go to Twitter and it's at Dojo Live. Simple as that. At Dojo Live. Just send us your questions. We'll read them back to Paul right here and we'll follow up. Or if you guys are listening from Nearsop, we have a channel for that and you know which one it is. It's Dojo Live. Questions. Oh. Actually, we have a question from, from one of our guys here. And this is from Fausto Guerrero right there in Hermosillo. Uh, Fausto is asking, Paul, when, when uh, well, he's wondering when we're going to ask him specifically about cloud. So that's what he's asking. Okay, you jittered in there on me. I don't know whether that is my internet or yours, but it was something specifically about cloud. What was that question again? I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I was saying, that we have a question from uh, one of my teammates yeah. in, uh, in Hermosillo. This is from Fausto. Fausto is asking, when are we going to be able to have a second conversation with you about cloud? Well, hey, whenever you want, I'm going to come down. I'm going to do it live from Mexico City. How does that sound? No, no, no. Come down to Hermosillo. Fausto has an amazing barbecue in his backyard. We can well, make that's some right. amazing that's, food. That's why I try. So, yeah, we do. <laughs> Yeah, but Tulio, don't forget that here in Mexico City at the office, we have a nice, very, very nice rooftop garden where we can actually barbecue. We can import Fausto, and he'll take care of the grill. Right, we have to fly a whole hour to get there, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can do that, and, and I think your viewers would greatly benefit from that. Uh, I see clients struggling with this all the time, what their path is to cloud, talking about security, talking about agility and cost. So there's good stuff to know there. So uh, yeah, let's uh, we'll start working on the next scheduling event for that one. How's that sound? Perfect, awesome. So Fausto, there you have it. Uh, we're 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 going to be coordinating with Paul for to schedule a second interview. Not likely to happen this month because we're booked, but it's probably after the month of June. So we'll keep in contact with Paul. So thank you, Paul, for your willingness to yeah. share your your wisdom here with the guys. All right. So well, I guess. Uh, any more? If we don't have any more questions from, oh, well, I have something to tell you guys. I'm, okay, cool. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm gonna put my Twitter handle here. I don't absolutely. Know that's the right way. It's big data underscore Paul Z. And okay. You, can you can, put that up there? Can you show it to oh, the camera again, please? Does it come out right, or does it come out backwards? Is it coming out right? Back it up a little bit. There, there you go. go. <laughs> there. It okay. Okay. I just got a screenshot of that. So yeah, absolutely. So here's the deal, guys. 
Uh, we ran into some technical difficulties today where I was going to show you some kind of live demos. I was going to build a neural network that created a Super Mario Brothers world. Uh, and we were going to do some other kind of fun stuff. Everything that I talk about here, before I talk about it on stage or online, it hit Twitter long before then. So I encourage you to jump on there uh, and check out some of the stuff I do. It's not in your face IBM advertising at all. In fact, it's, it's not even close to that. Only 10% of stuff's IBM. It's just general stuff on deep learning. And the other thing I'll tell you, well, I've been in analytics for a long time, so I understand SQL, NoSQL databases inside and out. I'm pretty new to AI. I know Hadoop very well. I know Spark, but I'm new to AI. I've been in this journey for one year, and people following me on Twitter have seen the journey. I share with you where I learned the journey, where I was able to start to create these demos and some practitioners to follow. So check me out on there. You'll up your game in AI and deep learning, and feel free to reach out to me whenever you want. Thank you, Paul. And of course, as you probably know, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, you cut out on me there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, fortunately, we're just uh, just a, a, a few final words because we're about to wrap up today's session. And today, uh, if for whatever reason you uh, if you're watching and then you happen to have stepped in late, uh, you can watch this interview. It's going to be right there on the Dojo Live website, which is right here, dojo.nearsop.com. Just go there, and Paul's interview, our our conversation with Paul is going to be right there. And on specifically on their uh, interviews. Okay, so that's go to the interview menu and then look for, for Paul for today's interview. It's it's going to be right there. Just we can and all the uh, the contact info for Paul is going to be right there too. Okay, with that being said, Paul, hey, the hey, only hey, thing hey, left for me to do is hang on. I think he's put up the yeah. Here it is, guys. So oh, here it is. The the world. World Brothers World, right? Okay, cool. I yeah. Created it on the side using a computer. And well, I just died. <laughs> oh, that was not good. I wanted to give you a better show than that, uh, but it's not going to happen. Well, well, we'll try it again here. So this game is generated by a computer in the background while we talk. Do you see all that cloud right here? Do you see how it's half built? That's because my model isn't perfect yet. I'm just learning how to use it, right? But you can see that this is the game, and a human didn't create this. You can go download this game and, and play it all you want. Oh, I died again. So anyways. I was going to go play that game for you, but again, this game was created by a computer just looking at other Super Mario Brothers games, so I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Wow, that's so cool. It is cool, isn't it? Well, we got it to work. We had problems with it earlier, so it's, it's yeah. great that you were able to show yeah. that to us. Yeah, that's my hacking ability. All I did was go on to the Super game. Mario Brother Maker world. I downloaded like 30 games, and I let the computer look at the patterns of games that other people built, and it built this. How cool is that? Whoa. Yeah. Way, cool. way cool, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Carlos also wanted to mention that on the Dojo Live site, uh, people can find Paul's contact information, including his Twitter handle, too. So if they didn't write it down, they can do that, too. Great. Guys, exactly. I your viewers the best. I appreciate the time. Yeah. Paul, okay. I encourage you to t uh, tune in next week, actually. Uh, I have an old colleague I work with 25 years ago coming on as a guest who I consider really a national treasure. The father of TCP IP himself, Vince Sir, is going to be our guest. And uh, it's 30 years since the internet was really uh, invented after Alpernet. It's the big question to be what's next? So uh, tune in because that's going to be an interesting show, I think. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Well, we're going to be in touch, and I hope you. We had a great time today. We're going to be uh, in touch soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.